Okay, well, I'd like you to turn, please, if you would, to the book of Revelation, chapter 4. I'm going to read the entire chapter. And although this chapter is really not the full vision, in fact, if we were uh, going to get the whole vision done, it would include chapter 4 and 5. It's really one unit, but the uh, text divides it. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> if you were just looking at it as one vision, it really would be chapter 4 and 5. So beginning in verse 1, it says, After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like an, unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word to our hearts. So just a simple title, really, that kind of deals with the two major themes that are in this chapter. One is the trumpet and the other is the throne. And so just a kind of a marvelous little chapter. And I really believe that these two things, the trumpet and throne, uh, kind of help us to, to see the big picture of the chapter. And I want to suggest to you that the trumpet pictures for us the rapture of the saints. We're going to think a little bit about that and why I believe that this has in view the rapture of the saints. And then uh, the throne uh, reveals to us the regal splendor of the sovereign, the one who is sat enthroned uh, over the universe. And it's good for us to get a glimpse of that throne this morning. So the chapter begins with this simple phrase, after this. And of course, it refers back to what has already taken place in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And I want to just suggest in a very simple way, after the church age has run its course, the trumpet will sound. <laughs> and like John... The door will be opened in heaven, and we with him will be caught up and we'll be in the presence of the Lord. That's the big picture. And so just to even think about after this, uh, I want you just to notice, he says, after this, I looked and behold, the door was opened in heaven. The first voice was, which I heard was of a trumpet talking with me and said, come up hither. And then notice this, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, if you remember our outline back in chapter one, and we're taking this right out of the text, so it's not uh, no kind of fanciful imagination here. This is right out of the text of Scripture. He says, write the things which thou hast seen, that was the vision in chapter 1, and the things which are, which is the history of the seven churches, 
And then finally, the things which shall be hereafter. And from chapter 4, verse 1, he's, he's looking future, prophetic, after the church has run its course, the things which shall be hereafter. And so he says, I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. And it's right out of the text. We're going to see the things that must be hereafter. The transition between the two periods, the, the things that are, the condition of the church is, the things that shall be hereafter is marked by the trumpet sounding. That's going to, as it were, divide these two uh, periods. And so I do believe we have a picture of the rapture of the church when the days of Enoch give place to the days of Noah. <laughs> Enoch taken out, Noah left to go through. And so that's going to be the picture here. We find several indications that this is so. First of all, notice a door opened in heaven. After this, I looked and behold, the door was opened in heaven. Now, heaven is not opened again in the book of Revelation until you get to chapter 19. And when you get to chapter 19, you want to just turn there for a moment. Uh, chapter 19 and verse 11, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Uh, and of course, we know this vision is Christ coming, uh, not uh, riding on the fall, of, uh, the fall of an ass coming to present himself, but now he's coming riding a warrior horse with the armies of heaven coming with him. And of course, you have to ask the question, those that are going to come with him, how did they get there in the first place? <laughs> well, they got in through the door in heaven in chapter four, and they're going to come when the heaven opens again in chapter 19 and ride triumphantly with Christ to the earth uh, to share in his victory. And so uh, notice again in chapter 19, verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And again, just amazing to think that we will share in that day. I mean, it's just staggering. We're just, we're reading these things, but these are going to really happen. This is not just some theoretical thing. We're actually going to be riding triumphantly with the Lord uh, from heaven. And of course, in order to do that, we got to get there first. <laughs> and we're going to get there when the trumpet sounds. So I saw a door opened in heaven. And <clears throat> notice too, um, this army that's clothed in white linen, fine and clean, they entered by the door here and leave with the Lord at the end of the tribulation. Now, what's interesting too is that uh, one of the great arguments perhaps one of the greatest arguments for pre-tribulationism is that you do not see the church mentioned on earth again from chapter four all the way through chapter 19. Uh, when you meant you hear the, the bride mentioned in chapter 19, verse seven, but again, the bride is mentioned in heaven, but no mention of the church on earth whatsoever. And, we're going to see that there will be people saved during the tribulation period. But we can be sure um, from the text that they're not church age saints. Uh, we're going to see something very different about them. There's going to be much more of a Jewish flavor about what's going to happen in the tribulation period to those that are saved. For instance, the Jew Gentile distinction is coming back again, right? The church. Uh, there, there's no neither Jew nor Gentile, uh, bond nor free. Uh, we're, we're all one in Christ. <clears throat> but when you get to tribulation period, we're going to see in chapter 7, uh, there'll be 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then there's going to be a great multitude uh, distinct from the 144,000. And again, that Jew-Gentile distinction is being introduced. We're going to see that uh, the martyrs are going to be calling down judgment on their enemies like like the imprecatory psalms of the old testament lord how long before you you know kind of reap judgment on these very different spirit 
to the church age where we're told to love our enemies, pray for those that despitefully use us, and where you have the spirit seen in Stephen, Lord, lay this sin not to their charge, just like his master. Uh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. So uh, very clear that there's a clear distinction between the, the tribulation saints, even in their attitude, the, the, the distinctions, all the rest of it, than we have right now at this current moment. We're going to see that God will take up his covenant dealings with Israel again after uh, the rapture of the church. So <clears throat> one thing that's interesting, just want to set the premise and then we'll, we'll kind of explain it as we go. But in chapters one through three, uh, the, the, the church is seen as a testimony on earth. In chapters 4 through 18, I believe the church is seen in the 24 elders as those that are near to the throne of God. And then in 19 through 22, the church is seen as the bride, the Lamb's wife, united to the heavenly bridegroom. So it's seen in three different phases. Testimony on earth, nearness to God's throne, and then united to Christ, the heavenly bridegroom. So notice um, it tells us that I, I heard this voice like the voice of a trumpet talking with me in verse 1. Now, we've already uh, seen that that voice of a trumpet was mentioned uh, in uh, chapter 1 and verse 10, where it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. <clears throat> and what thou seest, write in a book. So we know that the trumpet um, talking with him has already been mentioned, but we also recognize that the trumpet is has got great significance to the church. Uh, we know it because uh, that trumpet is mentioned in the the great rapture passages. And so I want to just look at these two passages. We're very familiar with them. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we have the trumpet mentioned. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And then 1 Corinthians 15 which again is another similar uh, rapture passage, uh, a very powerful passage uh, telling us some of the things that will happen when that trumpet blast sounds and we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So chapter 15, uh, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Isn't that interesting? We shall not all sleep. That's it's a, a tremendous promise, isn't it? Because sleep is what's a term that's used for believers uh, dying. Uh, it's always used of the saints. Uh, we will not all sleep. Some of us will not experience physical death, just like Enoch was. Uh, the Lord took him up to heaven without dying. Uh, it says we will not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Oh, that's a wonderful promise, isn't it? We shall all be changed. We're going to, going to be changed into his likeness. Uh, we can't wait for that, uh, to, to be so changed that we'll be like the Lord Jesus. And and to me, the, the one of the most exciting things about the rapture, and I've said this before, I'm not saying anything you've not heard me say, but is to be able to love the Lord with an unsinning heart. Isn't that just going to be tremendous? That's that's the hope of the rapture. Uh, we'll all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
for this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal put on immortality, so on and so forth. Death is swallowed up in victory. So the trumpet sounding, amazing thing. So John hears this sound of trumpet talking with him, which said, come up hither, come up here. And that's what the trumpet is going to signal for us. Come up here, <laughs> come to my house. Uh, uh, let's go to your house, uh, my house today. Uh, you come, you know, in my father's house and many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I come, I, I go to prepare a place for you, uh, that where I am, you may be also. Come up hither. Uh, it reminds me of uh, that lovely portion in Song of Solomon, where we read uh, in Song of Solomon, chapter two, and verses ten and eleven. It says. And my beloved spake and said unto me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. And isn't that going to be a beautiful moment for us when we hear the, the beloved voice of the bridegroom saying to us, come up here, <laughs> my beloved, come up here. Winter is past. It's over. The trials are done. The the difficulties, the hardships, winter is past. Uh, we I think we can appreciate that because we've just passed through our uh, physical winter, but the spiritual winter is past. And what a day that's going to be. And so John is caught up to heaven, I believe, as a, a, a type, a picture of the rapture of the church. And I will show thee things which must be here after. Things that from this vantage point in heaven, John is now a given a view of things which must be hereafter. Now, I want you to just think about this for a moment because um, he's the only prophet who actually gets to prophesy from heaven. See, Enoch was caught up to heaven without dying, but we didn't hear anything from him when he went up there we heard that he prophesied when he was down here but not when he went up there uh same with e elijah he was remember he was taken to heaven in a in a in a fiery chariot right chariots of fire took him to heaven but we never heard anything from him once he was up there he prophesied when he was down here even paul who was caught up to the third heaven and he saw things but what did he say that can't be uttered he didn't, he didn't give us any information from up there. We didn't, we didn't know what happened. And so John has the unique standpoint, if you like, of prophesying to us from heaven. And what he's going to do is he's going to show us things from heaven's perspective. All the other prophets, they, they, they might have got glimpses, but they were down here. Yeah, Ezekiel, he saw these visions, uh, but he was down here and he was looking at it from Earth's perspective. John is showing what's it all about from heaven's perspective. And so there's this uniqueness uh, in this particular prophecy. And by the way, that, that tells us something, doesn't it? All these people that died and went to heaven and want to tell us their story and write a best-selling book. The only person that has been given that privilege of giving us heaven's perspective is John. Nobody else said a word from heaven, just John. He's given us heaven's perspective. From this point on, in this chapter, the dominant theme is no longer the trumpet, but the throne. And it's mentioned 12 times in this chapter, of course, it speaks to us of absolute authority, and it's prominent throughout the, the whole prophecy. In fact, there's only six chapters in Revelation where the throne is not mentioned. Those are, that would be chapters 2, 9 and 10, 15 and 17 and 18. Six out of 22 chapters do not mention the throne but the rest do. So clearly the throne is very significant. Everything in this chapter and much of the book is related to the throne of God. And so why is this significant? 
Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that the reason that John is on the island of Patmos is because Rome had the throne in those days. Uh, they were the sovereign power. Uh, but John is given a vision of a greater sovereignty, that God is in supreme authority and he's still on the throne. His throne will never totter or fall. Human thrones come to an end. Those of us that uh, recognize uh, uh, the, the great service of Queen Elizabeth, we recognize that her service is done. <laughs> She's gone. Now there's going to be another one who's going to be uh, enthroned shortly. Isaiah, when he was... Uh, saw a vision of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, the one who was holy, holy, holy. Well, the context is it was the year that King Uzziah died. A human throne was empty. <laughs> it, it was a vacant throne, but he was taken and shown a throne that is never vacant and is never empty. And so it's, it's good to be reminded that this throne, is never vacant. It's it's the the picture of absolute and total sovereignty, and everything in this chapter relates to the throne. We're going to see upon the throne in verses two and three. I sat and looked upon. Uh, sorry, immediately I saw in spirit and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So we're going to look at upon the throne, deity sitting in inscrutable splendor, described for us in chapter, in verses two and three. And then we're going to see things that are round about the throne. Uh, we're going to see that in uh, chapter, uh, verses three and four and verses six and seven. We're going to see that round about the throne, there's a rainbow. There are 24 crowned elders and there are four living creatures. And we will we will look at them and learn lessons about them. And then we're going to see that as well as upon the throne and round about the throne, we're going to see that out of the throne in verse 5 is going to come lightnings and thunderings and voices. And then before the throne in verses 5, 6, and 10, there's going to be seven lamps of fire. There's going to be a sea of glass. And there are going to be cast the crowns of the 24 elders. And then when we get to um, the thought of in the midst of the throne, we have the four living creatures or, or beasts, as it says in Revelation in verse 6. But also um, we're going to see in chapter 5, verse 6, we're going to see and I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So we're going to see this lamb that is in the midst of the throne, a little lamb. Why you just notice this phrase, it says, uh, in verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, there was a throne set in heaven. A throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now, we've got two things we want to deal with here. First of all, I want to think of John being immediately in the spirit, and then we want to look at this idea of the throne set in heaven. Four times in Revelation, we find this phrase of in the spirit as it relates to the Apostle John. We've already seen the first one was in chapter 1 and in verse 10, where it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And that, that day, he saw a vision of the glorified Christ. Here. Once again, we see him, chapter 4, verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit. And what does he see this time? He sees the heavenly throne. And then the next time this phrase is used is in chapter 17 and verse 3. 
17 and verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And he gets a glimpse of this wilderness world while he's in the spirit. <laughs> and then the final one is in chapter 21. And verse 10, he carried me up in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and so on and so forth. So what does he see? In the spirit, he sees a glorified Christ. He sees a heavenly throne. He sees the wilderness that this world is. And in that kind of vision of the wilderness world, he sees the, the religion of the world, the, the Babylonian system as well, as part of that wilderness condition. And then he sees the, this, the, the city, the heavenly city in chapter 21. And in contrast to that Babylonian system, he sees the eternal dwelling place of the bride, the, lamb, the, the wife of the lamb. And so it, it, wonderful things that he sees in the spirit and all that we might see more constantly in our vision as we depend on the Holy Spirit, more of the glories of Christ, more of uh, our consciousness of the throne of heaven, more of an awareness of how much this world is a wilderness wide and also more expectation of that city. <laughs> Uh, whose foundations and, and maker is God, uh, that heavenly city, uh, the new Jerusalem. But those are things that uh, spirit-filled men, these things captured their imagination, captured their vision, and they need to certainly capture our vision and capture uh, our affections. So we, we said, second thing he sees is this throne set in heaven. And I want to just kind of think of this little thought of uh, the throne set in he heaven. I think it's a, it's a delightful idea. And, and that is this, that this throne that's set in heaven, men may challenge divine sovereignty, but it's fruitless. This throne is set. <laughs> it, 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 it's not going to move. It's not going to totter. It's not going to be overthrown. It's never going to be moved. It's set. I just love that idea of, of you know, men constantly challenging, defying, rebelling against God's authority, but it's all destined to failure. It stands. <laughs> and uh, are we not reminded of Psalm 2 a little bit? As we think of these these challenges to the throne, uh, Psalm two and verse six. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Just just the same idea. I, I've set my king. It's it's man's going to challenge this. They they say we won't have this man to reign over us. They uh, they they do everything to to defy the claims of Christ, but yet he will reign in Zion. God's throne is in heaven. I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. No matter what men do, the heathen can rage. The people can imagine a vain thing, but the purposes of God are never disturbed. He will accomplish everything that he says he will do. And so it's wonderful to see that this throne is set in heaven, undisturbed. And then he says, I was, I was in the spirit and behold, the throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Now he doesn't give us much of a description of the one seated on the throne because it's really indescribable. How do you describe the throne sitter? <laughs> Well, what he does do, he, he just gives us a little bit of detail, but, but not much. He says, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow around about the throne in the sight like an emerald. So the only details we, we have is when, we, when he sees the glory of the one who sits on the throne, he says it's like the jasper and the sardine stone. Now, how can we get any kind of 
grasp on what's being said here. Well, as I said early on in our study, a lot of the symbolism in the book of Revelation is found elsewhere in the book and can really help us uh, to grasp what's being taught here. And, and again, I, I said that the best way to understand Revelation is to understand the other 65 books. If we understand the other 65 books, this book will make perfect sense. And so let's begin with uh, this idea of where else do we see a jasper and a sardine stone? Well, it's in the high priest's breastplate. Back in the book of Exodus, chapter 28, Exodus chapter 28, and verses 17 through 21, where you get a description of this breastplate of the high priest. And you'll notice that verse 17, and thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius. Okay, so the first stone set in the high priest breastplate now these stones represent the 12 tribes of israel because the idea is that he's carrying the interests of the children of israel on his heart as he goes into the presence of god on their behalf so so each of these stones represents one of the tribes and if we uh, assume that it's in chronological order or birth order <clears throat> the first stone uh, we read about uh, is the Sardius stone. So we'll we'll think about, well, who was the first of Jacob's sons? But then notice it says, uh, so the Sardius, a topaz, a carbuncle, they shall be the first row. So <clears throat> set in uh, four, four rows of three. Four threes is 12, or three fours is 12, right? So <clears throat> that's the first row. The second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, a diamond, the third row, a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. So the first stone is a sardius stone, sardine stone. And the last one is a jasper, first and last. That's interesting. But then when we think of the birth order of the tribes, the first stone, the jasper, uh, the sardius, the first, the jasper, the last. First one is Reuben. And the last one is Benjamin. Okay, Reuben and Benjamin. Now, one thing that Reuben and Benjamin have in common is Ben. All right? And Ben means son. So let's just think of this. Reuben means behold a son. And then Benjamin, remember he was not Benoni, son of my sorrows, but Benjamin, son of my right hand. And so could the thought be that the one that sits on the throne, now clearly this is, this is God seated on the throne. It, it's not the Lord Jesus because they're clearly distinguished. In chapter five, notice verse six and seven, it says, behold and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So, so the one that sits upon the throne is clearly God the Father distinct from the son and yet when you look at the father you can't help but be reminded of behold the son son of my right hand <laughs> because you see when the lord jesus was on earth do you remember what he said to philip philip said lord show us the father how did philip respond he said how long have i been with you philip if you've seen me you've seen the father so the one that sits on the throne, well, he would remind us of the son, the son of his right hand. Because when the son, son of his right hand was on the earth, he remind, and it's kind of interesting. I remember after my, my own father had passed away, um, I went back to sort out his affairs. And I went into the little local shop where my dad used to do his, his shopping and the lady behind the counter who knew my dad very well almost passed out. She thought 
my dad had come back from the grave <laughs> because I looked like my dad. I walked like my dad. I mean, it was, we, we looked a lot alike. <laughs> and, uh, and here we got this beautiful idea that the one that sits on the throne would remind us of the one that came down to this earth, his son. Behold the son. Of course, that, and that's the message of scripture, isn't it? Behold the son. The one who was son of my sorrows, but now is son of my right hand. Behold the son. And so certainly the idea is that <clears throat> Christ the son will display in his person everything that belongs to the throne sitter. And so when we see the throne sitter, uh, the, what we'll see is this great resemblance to the son of God. Now, notice, too, that this throne, round about the throne, is this rainbow. Round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Now, this is important because the rainbow gives a message, doesn't it? Uh, it's, it's a message of God's being a covenant-keeping God. And the covenant, particularly the rainbow covenant, is connected to the earth. That he, he's not going to destroy the earth again, right? And, and it's kind of a, uh, his covenant keeping God, a symbol of God's covenant made with Noah subsequent to the flood. And you can imagine how important this was. Uh, he, because I think after, after these people that came out from the flood, uh, the, Noah and his sons... If they didn't have that assurance, every time it would rain, you would panic. <laughs> here we go again. <laughs> but but there's this evidence here. No, I'm not going to destroy the earth like I've done it before. A so, symbol of God's covenant made with subsequent to the flood. Why is it necessary that we see a rainbow around the throne right now? Because as we read Revelation, we might be tempted to think that God is going to destroy the earth completely. <laughs> These judgments, yeah, this thunder and lightning that's, that's speaking of a storm coming on planet earth, we might get the impression that God is going to destroy the whole thing, but he's still going to keep his covenant. In wrath, God remembers mercy. And even the judgments, severe as they will be, there will still be evident of God's covenant mercy with this planet as we go through these judgments that are about to be seen. And so I'm so thankful, by the way, that in, in wrath, God remembers mercy. That's a book, uh, quote from Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. But what a, what a beautiful, beautiful thought that in wrath, he remembers mercy. Of course, it's a, it's a, a rainbow, but it's, it's predominantly green. An emerald is a green uh, jewel. And, and so, again, the high priestly breastplate, who's emerald? <laughs> well, that's, that's Judah. <laughs> Interesting. Judah is represented by the emerald. And again, God's covenant mercy with this planet is connected with the lion of the tribe of Judah. It also represents grace. Green is the color of grace. It also represents life, uh, the color of chlorophyll. Uh, it, it's evergreen. That's, that's the chlorophyll is that absorbs, absorbs light and makes everything so green. And so there's no decay in God's covenant. It's still a covenant connected with life. Even in the midst of all the death in the book of Revelation, God's covenant stands. And it's round about the throne. In other words, it's, it's not a, a half rainbow. It's, it's complete. It's completely round about the throne. It's a, uh, so, again, from our vantage point on earth, we only see part of what's taking place. But from heaven, we get a full perspective. I've only ever seen once in my life a complete circle rainbow. And that was from an airplane. <laughs> I was up 35,000 feet 
and I saw a rainbow, but it was absolutely a complete circle. It was an amazing, and you can only see it from up there. You can't see it from down here. If you were down here, you'd only see part of it. And the idea is this, that God sees the whole picture. We only see a part of what's going on, but God is still working everything out. He's still keeping his covenant promises. He's still faithful, uh, even in the midst of wrath and outpouring of judgment. Now, we notice the next thing is in verse four, it says, round about the throne were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And of course, one of the things we have to try to determine is who are these 24 elders and lots of ink has been used trying to determine the identity of the 24 elders and they even heard a new one this week uh, so uh, but they're mentioned several times in revelation 4 through 19 seen here in chapter 4 and what we see is they're seated they're robed and they're crowned. <laughs> so we might say, because crowns in scripture, we know are connected with both reward and ruling. So uh, we might say that uh, whoever these are, they're already seated, they're already robed, they're already crowned, rewarded. They're clearly distinct from angels, because in chapter 5 verse 11, I behold and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So they're clearly distinct from angels. They're distinct from the saints of the great tribulation, because when you get to chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14, it says, one of the elders answered and saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Whoever these are, they certainly have a good understanding of the purposes of God, because in verse 5 of chapter 5, one of the elders says to me, weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals. So they, they certainly understand these things. I want to suggest to you that they cannot be or include Old Testament saints because the Old Testament saints do not get rewarded till the second advent. Look at chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 15 through 18. It says, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them, which destroy the earth. And so that reference to the servant, his servants, the prophets, and to the saints, the time of their rewarding is when Christ comes to the earth at the second advent. Okay? So I, I certainly don't see these as Old Testament saints. Their time for rewarding is at the second advent when Christ comes and takes up his kingdom, which will last forever and ever. Whoever these people are, they are redeemed and will re reign with Christ on the earth. Look at verse 9 and 10. It says, and they sung a new song. And let's just see who's singing it. Look at verse 8. When he had taken the book, the four beasts, four and twenty elders, fell down before the Lamb, 
having every one of them harps and golden vials full of olders, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And so to me, it seems very clear that these 24 elders represent a redeemed company who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and are going to reign on the earth with Christ as kings and priests. Now, to me, that seems to settle the matter, that it really is the church seen in heaven through these 24 elders. Now, why would 24 elders represent the whole? Remember, we're, we're, we're kings and priests. And so the, the emphasis is made us unto our God, kings and priests. Well, in the Old Testament, look back at First Chronicles chapter 24, and we'll see that the priesthood of the Old Testament, and again, David gets this by the spirit he he's this thing is revealed to him it says in verse uh, three of first chronicles 24 david distributed them both zadok of the sons of eliezer and himelek of the son of ithamar according to their offices in their service and there were more chief men found of the sons of eliezer than of the sons of Ithamar, and they thus were they divided among the sons of Eleazar. There were sixteen chief men of the house of their fathers, and eight among the sons of Ithamar, according to the house of their fathers. Thus were they divided by lot, one sort with another, for the government of the sanctuary, and governors of the house of God were of the sons of Eleazar and the sons of Ithamar. So notice that uh, sixteen and eight. Now, when I went to school, 16 and 8 makes 24. So there were 24 courses of priests in the Old Testament. And so now, when we see in heaven this kingdom of priests that have been redeemed by the Lamb, that are going to reign with the Lamb, and now divided into 24 representative groups. Uh, and I believe these are the elders that are referred to in the book of Revelation, this kingdom of priests completed their course of testimony in Revelation 2 and 3. They have they have got their white robes. Uh, they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They've been rewarded. They've got their crowns. And actually, uh, one of the things we're going to see is they're going to, verse 10 uh, of chapter 4, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne to worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O lord and i believe that one of the uh, things that the church will do is we will be around that throne and we'll cast the crowns whatever crowns we have won the victory crowns for service we'll cast them before the throne and what we'll do in doing that is we're simply saying this any good that was ever accomplished in my life was because of the lamb <laughs> because of because of his working uh, I, and so what a joy it will be to do that now notice verse five it says out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lamps of fire before burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of god Right now, when we think of the throne, we think of it as a throne of grace. Epistle to the Hebrews, we know it well, uh, but I want to read it to us just to, to help us see at this moment in history, we're not raptured, we're not rewarded, we're not crowned, we're just down here. And this throne, we have access to it every single day. <laughs> And he says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, Hebrews 4.16, that we may obtain mercy 
and find grace to help in time of need. What a wonderful thing that we have access to the throne. But the throne of grace is one day going to become a throne of judgment. Right now, it's throne of grace. Let's avail of it while we can. <laughs> Make the most of it. But it's going to become a throne of judgment. And we see here, after the church is caught up to heaven by the sound of the trumpet, there's, there's rumblings in the throne. Out of the throne, lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Now, when, when you see where we are in the Midwest, we have a lot of storms, especially this time of year. A lot of tornadoes, a lot of thunder and lightning and hail and all this kind of stuff. Very stormy when that cold Canadian weather comes down and meets the hot weather from the Gulf and they meet together and they dance and they have a get together. But there's, but you know when the storm is coming because you can hear the thundering. You can, in the distance, you can see the lightning flash in the distance. You know it's coming in your direction. And the picture is this, that a storm is coming on planet earth and let me tell you this when the when the trumpet sounds and we're caught out of here the the, the storm is coming on planet earth now it's going we're going to see throughout the book that this vision of the throne and its its thunderings and lightnings is going to be repeated but each time with greater intensity so the idea is this that that the storm is coming, but it, it's going to get more severe as we go through the, the tribulation period. Uh, and so right now at this point, it, it's, just, it's just lightning and thunder and voices. But look at chapter 8, please. And verse 5, 8 verse 5, it says, The angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake, okay? So no earthquake mentioned in chapter 4, but there's an earthquake. There was, uh, it's, there's a greater intensity. Chapter 11, verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Okay, so now we've got an added dimension, great hail added to the mix. The storm's getting worse. Now look, please, the last reference, 16, chapter 16, where the intensity reaches its peak, and verse 18, it says, there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great <laughs> and so uh, exceeding great great earthquakes which is not since so it, again the greater intensity is being seen as we go through uh, exceeding great and so we can see that this is speaking to us of god's judgment that is coming on the earth and it will grow in intensity. And then before the throne, seven lamps of fire. And of course, this is referenced to uh, burning fire before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Again, we said that seven is the number of completeness. Um, and so it's speaking to the Holy Spirit in his complete workings. But he's not seen as a dove or a comforter now but as a lamp of fire like a torch burning brightly seven and and so the idea is this illuminating conditions on the earth that require divine judgment that require this storm the spirit of god no longer in his ministry of comfort no longer in his ministry uh, of the holy dove but he is he is showing the conditions on the earth that merit this storm that is about to break. The lamp is shining brightly on planet Earth, showing the wickedness that demands divine justice and divine judgment. 
And then notice uh, one. We'll look at one more thing, and then we'll have to stop because our our hour is already gone, and we haven't finished this chapter. But uh, notice he also mentions verse six: before the throne, there's a sea of glass like unto crystal. And we just want to think about this sea of glass, like unto crystal. Unlike Isaiah fifty-seven twenty, where you get a glimpse of the troubled sea and it kind of it's a picture of worldly conditions on the earth isaiah 57 verse 20 says but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt there's no peace saith my god to the wicked so you get this picture of, of down here on earth like everything's tumultuous and, you know, kind of uh, restless, like the restless sea. But before the throne of God, all is calm. Like a sea of glass, clear as crystal, and, and, and not choppy, not disturbed. And isn't it wonderful to know that despite all that's going on on earth, there are no winds of change blowing in heaven. All is calm. <laughs> His purposes are unmoved, unchanged. He will accomplish everything he said he's going to do. It's all calm before the throne. Sometimes when we're going through life's storms, it's good to remind ourselves that the throne of heaven is undisturbed. And before that, there's a sea of glass. Clear as crystal. It's not murky or muddy. It's very clear. And it's all calm. All is rest. All is calm in the presence of God. What a wonderful thing to know. God is not disturbed about what's happening. <laughs> he knew all these things. Nothing caught him by surprise. Everything carries on as he purposed it to do. And so that should be a comfort to us. We'll have to pick up again, Lord willing, next Friday. But may the Lord encourage us with a glimpse of the throne. Amen.